Can everybody hear me? Do I need to bend over like this, or is it, am I clear standing up? Good. Well, thank you, uh, Jesus. Thank you, Gabrielle, Douglas. Of course, thank you. Uh, what a place to be in. What an honor it's been for us to be here, to speak in this room where the Dominicans met and, uh, as uh, Jesus explained to me, presented their papers uh, before they went public with them to their fellow Dominicans. Um, we're separated by just this wall from the graves of Pretoria and DeSoto. Of course, we have uh, St. Thomas there, and as Jesus pointed out, uh, we have the spirit of Murray Rothbard uh, very much with us, the spirit of Mises. Uh, how great to have um, Mrs. Bettina Bean Graves here with us, who of course was uh, Mises' close associate for so many years. The subject of the Middle Ages highlights the huge gulf that separates scholarly from popular opinion. For most, view, for most people, the, their view can be summed up in the words of a rock song by the group Spinal Tap. No one knows who they were or what they were doing. For many people, the medieval period brings to mind populations living by myths such as the flat earth and whose daily life was swept along by crazy superstitions such as we might see in a Monty Python skit. Scholarly opinion, however, knows otherwise. The time between the 8th and the 16th centuries was a time of amazing achievements in many areas of knowledge, such as theology, architecture, music, biology, mathematics, astronomy, industry, and yes, economics. One might think it would be enough to look at the astonishing brilliance of the Burgos Cathedral begun in 1221, or any of the hundreds of others built at this time, to know that there is something gravely wrong with the popular wisdom. And so it is with economics. The popular wisdom comes through in the convention among non-specialists that traces the origins of pro-market thinking to Adam Smith. The tendency to see Smith as the fountainhead of economics is reinforced among Americans because his book came out the same year as America seceded from Great Britain. There is much in this intellectual history that is overlooked. The real founders of economic science actually wrote, as we know, hundreds of years before Smith. They were not economists as such, but moral theologians, trained in the tradition of St. Thomas Aquinas, and they came to be known as the late scholastics. They did for economics, what architectural studies and geometry did for the building of churches. They created, oh, thank you, Walter. They created a glorious edifice that still stands today. These men, most of whom taught in Spain, were at least as pro-free market as the much later Scottish tradition. Plus, their theoretical foundation was even more solid. They anticipated the theories of value and price of the marginalists of late 19th century Austria. The scholar who rediscovered the late scholastics, excuse me, <clears throat> the scholar who rediscovered the late scholastics for the English speaking world was Raymond de Ruver. For years, these men had been ridiculed and sloughed off and even called pre-socialists. R.H. Taney said that Karl Marx was the quote, last of the schoolmen, a view that caused people to put down their writings. But de Ruver demonstrated that almost all the conventional wisdom was wrong. Joseph Schumpeter gave the late scholastics a huge boost with his posthumously published 1954 book, History of Economic Analysis. It is they, he wrote, who come nearer than does any other group to having been the founders of scientific economics. About the same time there appeared a narrative in a book of readings by Marjorie Grice Hutchinson recently published, republished by the Mises Institute. In our own time, Alejandro Trufuin linked the late scholastics closely with the Austrian school. In the fullest and most important treatment to date, Marian Rothbard's An Austrian Perspective on the History of Economic Thought 
presents the extraordinarily wide range of late scholastic thought and offers an explanation for the widespread misinterpretation of the School of Salamanca, plus an overarching framework of the intersection between economics and religion from St. Thomas through the mid-19th century. What emerges from this growing literature is an awareness that the Middle Ages were the founding period of economics. Recall the opening words of Mises' own human action. Economics, he said, is the youngest of all the sciences. And what did economics contribute? Mises explains that economics discovered a regularity in the sequence and interdependence of market phenomena. In so doing, it conveyed a knowledge which could be, not, which could be regarded as not logic, not mathematics, not psychology, not physics, not biology. Let me pause here with some comments on those who outright reject economics as a science. This tendency is not limited to the leftists who embrace the fantasy called socialism, nor to the environmentalists who think that society should be reduced to the status of a hunting and gathering tribe. I'm thinking in particular of a group that we might call conservatives, people who believe that all we need to know about reality and truth is contained in the writings of the ancient philosophers, the church fathers, or some other time-tested source. Whereas anything modern, defined as anything written after the latter half of the second millennium of Christianity, is generally seen as suspect. This tendency is widespread on the American right and extends to the Straussians, the right communitarians, the paleoconservatives, and the religious conservatives of the Christian right. There are examples among them all. To seek economic wisdom, they brush aside anything of the last 500 years and return again and again to the writings of the early saints, of Plato and Aristotle, and to words of wisdom for many other revered non-moderns. Now, these writings, in these writings, one can discover, of course, great truths. However, it is simply not the case that one can find rigorous economic logic among the ancients. The writings of this period tend to be imbued with a bias against the merchant, a fallacy about the equality of value in exchange, and a general lack of conviction that there exists a persistent logic for understanding the development of the market. Mises was right. The development of economics began much later, and the reason for this is rather straightforward. The appearance of widespread economic opportunity, social mobility driven by material status, the dramatic expansion of the division of labor across many borders, and the building of complex capital structures only began to be observed in the late Middle Ages. It was the appearance of the rudimentary structures of modern capitalism that gave rise to the curiosity about economic science. To put it quite simply, it was in the late Middle Ages that there appeared to be something to study at all. It was in this period on the continent that we began to see what was previously unheard of. Large swaths of the population began to grow rich. Wealth was no longer limited to kings and princes. It was, not available, it was available not only to merchants and bankers. Workers and peasants, too, could increase their standard of living, make choices about where to live, and acquire clothing, furniture, and food once reserved for the nobility. In addition, monetary institutions became increasingly complex with a variety of exchange rates, pressures to permit the paying and charging of interest, and complex invest investment transactions making their way into daily life. It was particularly interesting to see wealth being generated in the area of financial services. People who were doing nothing rather than arbitraging exchange rates were growing enormously rich and influential. These were people who, in the words of Saravia de la Calle, were seemed to be traveling from fair to fair, from place to place, with nothing but a table and boxes and books. And yet their wealth grew and grew. This, and this, this gave rise to the scientific question um, of how this was happening. It also gave rise to the broadest forms of moral questions. What exactly is the status of the merchant in moral theology? How should this form of money-making be regarded by society and by the church? 
These sorts of questions cried out for answers. Now let us understand a bit more about the scholastic mind as it is shaped in the tradition of St. Thomas. At the root of the Thomist worldview was a conviction that all truth was unified into a single body of thought, and that this truth ultimately pointed to the author of all truth. And so far as the science was, and as so far as the scientist was seeking truth, the truth he found was necessarily reconcilable, reconcilable with all other existing truth. In this way, the scholastics saw the idea of truth as operating very much like mathematics. It was all integrated from the lowest to the end, most fundamental forms to the highest and most elaborate. If there was a, con if there was a contradiction or a failure to link a higher truth to a lower truth, one could know with certainty that something was wrong. So knowledge was not parceled out and segmented the way it is today. Today, students go to classes on math, literature, economics, building design, and don't expect to find any links among the disciplines. I'm quite certain it would never occur to them to try. It is just an accepted aspect of the positivist program that knowledge need not be integrated. We must all exist in a state of suspended skepticism concerning everything and then be buffeted about randomly by the latest ideological fad that seems to have some scientific support. The conviction that small truth is related to larger truth has been eviscerated. It is sometimes said that the scholastic attitude towards truth made them skeptical towards scientific inquiry. The very opposite is true. Their conviction concerning inter integral truth made them utterly fearless. There was no aspect of life that should escape serious scholarly investigation. No matter the findings, if they were true, if the investigation, then the investigation be see, could be seen as part of a larger mission of discovering more about God's own creation. There could be no such thing as a dichotomy between science and religion, so no one need hesitate to discover more about either or both. It is not precisely correct to say that the late scholastic thinkers who discovered economics were exploring theological territory and inadvertently and inadvertently stumbled upon economics. They were, in fact, intensely curious about the logic that governs relations among choices and people in the marketplace. And they looked at the subject without feeling the need to constantly point to theological truth. The relationship between economics and theology was assumed as part of the scholarly enterprise itself. And this is why the late scholastics could write with such precision on economic subjects. As Spain, Portugal, and Italy emerged as the centers of commerce and enterprise in the 15th and 16th centuries, the universities under the control of the late Thomas spawned a great project of investigating the regular patterns that govern economic life. I would like to present briefly some of these thinkers and their work. The first of the moral theologians to research, write, and teach at the University of Salamanca in this tradition was Francisco de Vittorio. Under his guidance, the university offered an extraordinary 70 professional professorial chairs. As with some other great mentors in history, most of Vittorio's published work comes to us in the form of notes taken by his students. In Vittorio's work in economics, he argued that the just price is the price that has been arrived at by common agreement among producers and consumers. That is, when a price is set by the interplay of supply and demand, it is the just price. So it is with international trade. Governments should not interfere with prices and relations established among traders across borders. Vittoria's lectures on Spanish Indian trade, originally published in 1542, argue that government intervention with trade violates the golden rule. He also made contributions to liberalizing the rule against the charging and paying of interest. And this discussion helped sow a great deal of confusion among theologians on precisely what constituted so-called usury, and this confusion was highly welcomed by entrepreneurs. He was also very careful to take supply and demand into account when analyzing currency exchange. Yet Vittoria's greatest contribution was producing gifted and prolific students. They went on to explore almost all aspects, moral and theoretical, 
of economic science. For a century, these thinkers formed a mighty force for free enterprise and economic logic. They regarded the price of goods and services as the consequence of the actions of traders. Prices vary according to circumstances, depending on the value that individuals place on goods. That value, in turn, depends on the factors, the goods, uh, on two factors, the goods availability and their use. The price of goods and services as a result of the operation of these forces. Prices are not fixed by nature or determined by the cost of production. Prices are the result of the common estimation of men. Domingo de, Soto, Domingo de Soto was a Dominican priest who became a professor of philosophy at Salamanca. He held powerful positions with the emperor, yet chose the academic life. He made important advances in the theory of interest, arguing for a general liberalization. He was also the architect of the purchasing parity theory of exchange. He observed that the more plentiful money is in Medina, the more unfavorable are the terms of exchange, and the higher the price that must be paid by whoever wished to send money from Spain to Flanders, since the demand for money is smaller in Spain than in Flanders. And the scarcer the money in Medina, the less the need to pay there, because more people want money in Medina than are sending it to Flanders. With these words, he had taken large steps towards justifying the profit that comes from currency arbitrage. It was not by chance the currency valuations came to be. They reflect certain facts on the ground and the choices of people in search of real, in light of real scarcities. He concludes that it is lawful to exchange money for one price in one place for money in another place. It is moral to receive a smaller sum in a place where money is scarce in exchange for a larger where it is abundant. Another Vittoria student was Martin de Aspilqueta Navarros, a Dominican friar, the most prominent canon lawyer of his day, and eventually the advisor to three successive popes. Navarros was the first economic thinker to state clearly and unequivocally that government price fixing is wrong. When goods are plentiful, there is no need for a maximum price. When they are not, price controls do more harm than good. In a manual on moral theology, Navarro's pointed out that it is not a sin to sell goods at a higher price than the official when it is agreed to among all parties. Navarro's was also the first to fully state that the quantity of money is a main influence in determining its purchasing power. Other things being equal, he wrote, in countries where there is a great scarcity of money, all other saleable goods and even the hands and labor of men are given for less money than where it is abundant. He is generally regarded as the first thinker to observe that the high cost of living is related to the quantity of money. The purpose of shoes, he said, is to protect our feet. Can, is that coming through clearly? Oh, good. The purpose of shoes is to protect our feet, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't be traded at a profit. In his view, it would be a terrible mistake to shut down foreign exchange markets, as some people were urging at the time. The result, he said, would be to plunge the realm into poverty. The greatest student of Navarro's was Diego de Covarrubias y Lieva, considered the best jurist in Spain since Vittoria. The emperor made him chancellor of Castile, and he eventually became the bishop of Segovia. His book, Variarum, was the clearest explanation on the source of economic value to date. The value of an article, he said, does not depend on its essential nature, but on the estimation of men, even if that estimation is foolish. For this reason, the justness of a price is not dictated by how much the item costs or how much labor went into acquiring it. All that matters is what the common market value is at the place and at the time when it is sold. Prices fall when buyers are few and rise when there are many bidders for the same item. It seems like a simple point, but it was missed by economists for centuries until the Austrian school rediscovered the subjective theory of value and incorporated it into microeconomics. Like all these Spanish theorists, Covarrubias believed that individual owners of property had inviolable rights to that property. One of the many controversies at the time is whether plants that produce medicines ought to belong to the community. Those who said they should pointed out that the medicine was not a result of human labor or human skill. 
The Kavarubia said that everything that grows on a plot of land belongs to the owner of that land. That owner is even entitled, he said, to withhold valuable medicine from the market, and it is a violation of the natural law to force him to sell. Another great economist in the Victoria line of thinkers was Luis de Molina, among the first of the Jesuits to think about theoretical economic topics. Though devoted to the Salamancan school and its achievements, Molina taught in Portugal at the University of Coimbra. He was the author of a five-volume treatise. His contributions to law, economics, and sociology were enormous, and his treatise went through many editions. Among all the pro-free market thinkers of his generation, Molina was the most consistent in his view of economic value. Like the other late scholastics, he agreed that goods are not valued according to their ability or perfection, nobility or perfection, excuse me, but according to their ability to serve human utility. But he provided this compelling example. Rats, according to their nature, are more noble, that is, higher up in the hierarchy of creation than wheat. But rats are not esteemed or appreciated by men because they are of no utility whatsoever. Of course, PETA was not around in those days to, conf to protest that point. <laughs> the use value of a particular good is not fixed between people or with the passage of time. It changes according to individual valuations and availability. This theory also explains peculiar aspects of luxury goods. For example, why would a pearl which can only be used to decorate, be more expensive than grain, wheat, wine, or horses. It appears that all these things are far more useful than a pearl, and they are certainly more noble. As Molina explained, valuation is done by individuals, and we can conclude that the just price for a pearl depends on the fact that some men want a granite value as an object of decoration. Molina understood the crucial importance of free-floating prices and their relationship to enterprise. Partly this was due to his extensive travels and interviews with merchants of all sorts. When, as a good, when a good is sold in a certain region or place at a certain price, he observed, so long as it was without fraud or monopoly or any foul play, then that price should be held as a rule and measure to judge the justness of the price of said good in that region and at that time and in that place. If the government tries to set a price that is higher or lower, then it would be deeply unjust. Molina was also the first to show why it is that retail prices are higher than wholesale prices, that consumers buy in smaller quantities and are willing to pay more for incremental amounts. The most sophisticated writings of Molina concern money and credit. Like Navarre's before him, he understood the relationship of money to prices and knew that inflation resulted from a higher money supply. Just as the abundance of goods causes prices to fall, he writes, specifying that this assumes the quantity of money and number of merchants remains the same. So too does an abundance of money cause prices to rise, specifying the quantity of goods and number of merchants remain the same. He even went further to point out that how wages, income, and even dowries eventually rise in the same proportion to which the money supply increases. He used this framework to push out the accepted boundaries of charging interest, or so-called usury, a major sticking point for most of the economists of the period. He argued that it should be permissible to charge interest on any loan involving an investment of capital, even when the return does not materialize. Molina's defense of private property rested on the belief that property is secured in the commandment, thou shalt not steal. But he went beyond the, his contemporaries by making strong practical arguments as well. When property is held in common, he said, it won't be taken care of and people will fight to consume it. Far from promoting the public good, when property is not divided, the strong people in the group will take advantage of the weak by monopolizing and consuming all resources. Like Aristotle, Molina also thought that common ownership of property would guarantee the end of liberality and charity. But he went further to argue that alms must come from private goods and not from common ones. In most writings on ethics and sin today, different standards apply to government than to individuals, but not in the writings of Molina. He argued that the king can, as king, commit a variety of mortal sins. 
For example, if the king grants a monopoly privilege to some, he violates the consumer's rights to buy from the cheapest seller. Molina concluded that those who benefit from monopolies are required by moral law to offset the damages they cause. Vittoria, Navarus, Covarrubias, De Soto, and Molina were five of the most important among more than a dozen extraordinary thinkers who had solved difficult economic problems long before the classical period. Trained in the Thomas tradition, they used logic to understand the world about them and looked for institutions that were, would promote prosperity and the common good. It is hardly surprising, then, that many of the late scholastics were also passionate defenders of the free market and human liberty. Ideas are like capital in the following sense. They are the work of many generations. In the case of economic logic, it was certainly the work of hundreds of years. Once understood, economics becomes part of the way we think about the world. If we don't understand it, many aspects of the way the world works continue to elude our vision and grasp. It is striking how much of the knowledge of the late scholastics became lost, at least in the English-speaking world, over the centuries. Britain, of course, there remains something of an isolated outpost in this area due to language and geography. But the continental tradition developed a pace. In particular, it came to be developed in France in the 18th and 19th centuries. But it is striking that the major resurgence of the scholastic tradition came out of Austria in the late 19th century, a country that had avoided a revolutionary political or theological upheaval. If we look at Menger's own teachers, we find successors to the scholastic tradition. Mises wrote that economics is a new science, and he was right about that. But it is no less true for being so. Those who obstinately avoid its teachings, whether on the left or the right, are only denying themselves a pipeline to truth, and they are actively in denial of reality. This is no basis for recommending any way forward. As for the modern economists, who are stuck in the positivist planning mode, they too have much to learn from the school of Salamanca, the members of which would not have been fooled by the fallacies that dominate modern economic theory and policy. If only our modern understanding could arrive once again at the high road paved for us more than 400 years ago. Just as the cathedrals of old retain their integrity as structures of beauty and stability, the Austrian school, as descendant of the ideas of Salamanca, remains with us to speak an, an integrated truth regardless of the intellectual fashions of the day. Thank you.